You're listening to episode 234A of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about your mysterious feedback on some of our recent episodes. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, Jimmy, I want to start with a bit of video feedback that we got from a listener who is in some place that a lot of people will recognize. And here we go. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Greetings from beautiful Vatican City. I just wanted to tell you that I love Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. You guys are the highlight of my Friday. Thank you so much for doing what you do. And I want to thank Paul for um, for sending us uh, some video from St. Peter's Square. That's awesome. Uh, hope you had a, I believe I, uh, Paul mentioned by email that he was there visiting. And so hope, hope you had a great visit and thank you very much for sending us the video feedback because video exists now. This is the <laughs> 21st century. So people can send us video feedback. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So our first, first bit of uh, feedback is general feedback, and this comes from an al- anonymous listener as an audio feedback. I've, uh, I've been uh, binge-watching your show because I discovered it recently, and I, I really have enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I find your perspective very interesting. And so I had an idea um, for a possible episode. I was thinking about, I just remembered Phineas Gage, the man from the um, 1800s railroad worker who... Um, had a spike fly through his skull after an explosion happened and destroyed part of his brain and he suffered brain damage. However, he survived and was basically the same person functionally. However, his personality changed and he became, uh, he lost his job afterwards because he became, you know, very profane and mean, mean spirited, but he survived. And I thought that was interesting. And so I, I, I want you to do an episode on, um, sort of brain damage and with your sort of faith and reason perspective, which I love is like, you know, how does that affect your status of grace? And what is in, I think there's a lot to say about the faith perspective on that, um, obviously. And so you've touched on it in the past, um, but, and there's other examples. There's the, the Texas um, University of Texas bell tower shooter who had like a tumor in his brain and caused him to uh, commit a massacre. And so what does the, the physical effects on the brain, you know, causing you to do immoral things, how does that play into your free will and grace and how does God view that? I think that would be a super interesting thing. And that could be multiple episodes. I think there's a lot to say on that. So anyway, just an idea to spark your imagination, but keep up the good work, Jimmy. And uh, I, I very much enjoyed the show. I find it very interesting. Thank you very much. I've been planning to do a show covering Phineas Gage for a long time, so we'll definitely be talking about him in the future. Uh, in brief, if an injury completely robs you of your moral decision-making power, the state of your soul will basically freeze at that moment, no matter what you later do. If you were already in a state of grace, you will you will stay in a state of grace because you weren't responsible for any sins you committed. Um, on the other hand, if you if you were not in a state of grace and you are able to receive the sacrament, well, then the sacrament would uh, communicate grace to you and you'd return to a state of grace because you're not in a position where you can act, where you're actively opposing the reception of grace. If the injury harms but does not remove moral decision making power, then it constitutes an impediment that you have to fight. And God will take that Im- impediment into account in assessing what you later do. All right. Our next feedback comes from Ryan O'Hanlon, who writes, My son Patrick, age nine, had to do a poster to begin the school year. It was designed for the kids to get to know each other. They were asked to choose a person who they find inspiring. And guess who he chose with absolutely no prompting or suggestion? Please see the attached image. And if you're watching our YouTube video, um, we're going to put that on screen now. And it is, of course, an image of Jimmy, uh, not me, but Jimmy. And Patrick wrote, the reason I think he's inspiring is because he teaches my religion. He comes up with cool and fun podcasts. He is smart like me. And most of us that want to be 
The last thing that makes him inspiring to me is his humor. And that is why I think Jimmy Yakin is inspiring. Ryan then says, I wanted to let you know that we appreciate your body of work, books, radio, podcasts, and that you are making seriously important impacts on a lot of us. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you very much, Patrick. That's extremely flattering. And I hope you have a great <laughs> school year. Yes. Uh, Jimmy inspires me too, folks. So just so you know. <laughs> so our next feedback comes from our episode 213 and 214 on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, there's two pieces of feedback that come from Stefano and his sons, and I'll play them here. My name is Stefano. I'm here with my kids, Colby and Giorgio, and we just crossed through all of Canada, and we heard a bunch of your podcasts. We loved the two episodes on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Really informative. We learned a lot and really entertaining. And uh, we agree with you that it was... It was God who preserved us from uh, the death of a third of the human population. And we just want to thank you for making this great episode. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Say thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jimmy, this is Stefano and Colby and Georgia again. We did have a theory, which is when um, President Kennedy was telling Khrushchev that he had to get his offensive weapons out of Cuba. And Khrushchev just was saying, no, no, there's just defensive weapons. We think that Khrushchev was actually referring to his shoe. It was the shoe-banging weapon, which is typically a defensive one, in which somebody approaches you on your desk at the UN, you want to get him away, and you bang his fingers with the heel of your shoe on the desk. So our theory is that he was referring to that. So he wasn't actually lying when he said, no, no, these are defensive weapons. It was just a misunderstanding. Kennedy was talking about the missile, and Khrushchev was talking about the heel of his shoe. Let us know what you think. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, um, I think it's a very interesting theory, and I would be very happy if in the future all conflict was confined to simply banging people's fingers with shoes. <laughs> So our next feedback comes from patron Jason Edwards on Patreon, who writes, loved this episode. I'm just old enough, born in 1977, to remember the last few years of the Cold War and have always been fascinated by the imagery, propaganda, spies, etc. of the conflict. So scary, bizarre, brilliant and intriguing all at once. After 9-11, I said to a friend of mine that I missed having an enemy like the Soviet Union because with the terrorists we were now facing... We'd lost an enemy that cared about mutually assured destruction or mad. I remember listening to an audiobook that explained how some of the spies that leaked our A-bomb tech to the Soviets justified their treason by saying they did it to ensure that with mad on the table, the world would avoid nuclear war. They believed that if we were the only ones with the bomb, we'd use it again since we had already used it before. Interesting theory. Yeah, interestingly, um, President Eisenhower was surprisingly sympathetic to this point of view, and he ordered the release of a lot of information that had previously been nuclear secrets. Um, we'll also be talking about the atomic spies in future episodes. Joe Stemler writes via email, Thank you for your episode 214 story about the potential starts to nuclear war on Black Saturday. These are details I never knew. There is a lot to be said about the fragility of the world. Shortly after hearing it, I ran across an article that mentions Soviet atmospheric nuclear test 184 over Kazakhstan on October 22, 1962. The electromagnetic pulse caused power system failures and power plant fires. It's also possible that the EMP may have damaged the Sputnik 22 Mars flyby launch system, causing an upper stage failure during launch two days later that produced debris in orbit that was, quote, momentarily feared to be the start of a Soviet nuclear ICBM attack, end quote. Too much for my mind. I'll just thank God for each day. Yeah, some of the nuclear tests uh, that were done by both sides resulted in much bigger explosions than were intended. And um, there have been other close calls with nuclear war, some of which we'll be talking about in the future. Chad Bailey writes on Facebook, terrific show as always. One topic I would love to hear you address. How and when, if at all, can nuclear weapons be reconciled with Catholic just war doctrine? 
I would also include strategic bombing of a non-nuclear type, such as the firebombing of Tokyo. Thanks for a wonderful show, as always. Well, briefly, um, deliberately targeting civilians is always wrong, whether you're targeting them by nuclear or non-nuclear means, such as firebombing. Therefore, deliberately targeting civilians for nuking or incendiary destruction or any other kind of destruction is just wrong. However, civilian deaths can be tolerated if the actual target is a military one of greater value. Uh, therefore, there are, in principle, some targets that could be of such high value that it could justify the undesirable but foreseen side effect of a significant number of civilian deaths, regardless of the means that cause them. It's not like nukes are somehow different than everything else. They're just a different means of destruction. They're a bomb. And so the same principles that apply to other bombs apply to nukes as well. Jean Rudiger Lorenz on Facebook writes, I was six years old when this occurred and was living in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Many of my neighbors built themselves fallout shelters in their backyards. My dad didn't, though, as I think he was a fatalist and felt that if there was ever a need of a shelter, the life afterwards for survivors wouldn't be worth living. Yeah, and many people have been of that opinion, that in the wake of a nuclear war, the survivors would envy the dead. And so not everybody wanted to take the precautions of things like building fallout shelters. Christopher Johnson writes on YouTube, I would love to believe that artificial wombs could be a game changer for the abortion debate, but I'd thought that church teaching and or the natural law principles that undergird it was against the use of artificial wombs. I know, and you've reiterated, you've reiterated this, that the church does oppose in vitro fertilization. Would artificial wombs perhaps be different because the actual conception happened normally and naturally? Or is it also a problem for a child to not be born in the normal and natural way? Well, a normal, natural birth is not absolutely morally required. Uh, the church has never had a problem, for example, with cesarean sections. Um, and those are not normal, natural births. Uh, we also already have artificial wombs. The incubators that we use to keep premature babies alive are generation one artificial wombs, and they're getting better all the time. The key distinction, as you indicate, is the w not the way in which the child is delivered or incubated, but the way it's conceived, which does need to be a normal, natural conception although it can be assisted by medical technology. What it cannot be is replaced by medical technology, which is what happens in, each, in, in vitro fertilization. Blake Sutherland writes on YouTube, the Cuban Missile Crisis was instigated by Kennedy placing Jupiter missiles in Turkey and Italy in 1961. The Soviets were only reacting to that deployment. I personally think JFK is the most overrated president in US history and was very reckless in his personal and public life. I don't get how people could admire the guy after he bungled the world to the brink of nuclear destruction. It is a legitimate point of view to argue that the Cuban Missile Crisis was the product of Kennedy's missteps. Uh, that's a position that people can argue for or against, although we don't have any evidence that I'm aware of that he actively foresaw that the Cuban Missile Crisis would happen. He, he was very reckless in his personal life, and I'll leave it to others to judge how he did professionally as president. Maria from Adelaide, South Australia, writes on YouTube, It is said that we are all put on this earth for a reason. It seems from your research of the Cuban Missile Crisis that John F. Kennedy, as flawed as he was, was placed by God to be president of the USA at that time in history to stop the nuclear holocaust that would have ensued had anyone else been in charge? I was 12 years old and growing up in Scotland at that time, so there was no awareness of what was going on between the USA and the USSR where I was. Though there certainly would have been dire consequences for Scotland as well had anything happened. I'd just like to say how much I've been enjoying your podcasts and YouTube videos. I've been binging on them for the past few months and have slowed down from watching two to three per day to one a day as I am nearly caught up. Don't know what I will do when I have to wait for a week between each fix. Thank you for all the effort, Jimmy and Dom, that you put into these shows. 
Thank you. And we're now throwing in some bonus episodes like this one into the mix. So actually, we're doing more than an episode every Friday now. And uh, also, you know, be sure, if you haven't already, be sure and subscribe to get the additional videos I do. And speaking of bonus episodes, here's some feedback on one of them. Right. Here's our feedback on episode 214A, Crossover Close Encounters. And Joe Abamusa on YouTube writes, Close Encounters is still one of Spielberg's sci-fi masterpieces, but decades later, he distanced himself from the work, saying today he would make the protagonist more responsible and not leave his family at the end. The director also affirmed that in just about every film he's made, the separation between parent and child and reunion, or lack thereof, is a theme he consciously explores, reflecting his own painful experience with his parents' divorce. Men often have to prove themselves suitable father figures or heroes in his films, whereas the women are already strong and stable. The Dreyfus character is likable, but definitely falls on the unstable side, never coming through, as far as we know, for his family, whereas later male characters in other films, Last Crusade, Jurassic Park, War of the Worlds, begin weak, but then prove strong by rescuing their kids, or the kids saving the father as well. The character arcs changed in his films as the director himself matured and started his own family. Yeah, uh, the Richard Dreyfuss character in Close Encounters, even though he's he's portrayed as sympathetic, he really goes nuts. And his, his wife, Terry Garr, comes off much better by comparison. Mm. Uh, on YouTube, Tom Jambon writes, Would it be okay for a Catholic to go with the aliens in an exchange program? knowing they may not have access to the sacraments, possibly for the rest of their lives? If you knew that you'd never come back and never have access to the sacraments, that would be justifiable only for extreme reasons, like you need to prevent an interstellar war or something like that. However, um, sailors of old would go on multi-year voyages that they might not come back from, and that was an accepted risk. Um, they'd also sometimes take priests with them, which would be the preferred solution here. Then on our episode number 215 on Urim and Thummim, we have this audio feedback from Father Sam. Hi, Jimmy and Tom. This is Father Sam from Australia. I'm a big fan of the show. I was really fascinated by your recent episode on the Urim and Thummim. And as you were describing some of the possible descriptions, especially the binary or two-bit options, I was reminded of the traditional Australian gambling game called Two Up. The game was played a lot by the Australian diggers or soldiers during World War I, and therefore it's only legal for us to play in Australia now on the 25th of April or Anzac Day, the equivalent of our Memorial Day. But basically the game uh, consists of taking two large pennies and placing them on a kip or a small paddle, and they're tossed into the air by the spinner. The bettors, or what we call punters, place bets on the result being either heads or tails. So in two up, the only acceptable result of a spin is either two heads or two tails, hence the name two up. When a spin results in one head and one tail, we call that an odds flip, and it results in reflipping the coins, which just adds to the whole tension of the game. Now, this got me thinking that the Urim and Thummim could have been like two identical coins with Urim printed on one side and Thummim on the other, which would explain their plural names. The high priest, like the spinner, may have asked a binary question and then tossed both coins, Urim being yes and Thummim being no or vice versa. And an odds flip in this context may have been interpreted by the high priest as ambiguous and equivalent to God not answering that day. Just a thought. I'll leave it with you. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, and it could potentially work. Um, we did cover uh, the passage where in, in uh, I guess, First Samuel, where Saul says, if the guilt is with me or my son Jonathan, give Urim, and if it's with the people, give Thumim. And that could be read as if the Urim and Thumim were single objects, you know, give us one or the other. Um, but it also could be read as meaning, well, give us two Urim, a clear reading in that direction, or give us two Thumim, a clear reading in that direction. Paul Solkowski writes on Facebook, Hi, Jimmy. I listened to this episode with great fascination. One theory jumped into my mind. 
Consider that the Urim and Thummim was actually a more complex system. The whole system included a flat stone for every letter of the alphabet, plus one more, a flat stone which is blank. If complex bandwidth answers are sought, all of the stones are present in the pouch. If simple yes-no is sought, only three stones are present, A, Z, and blank. If the blank stone is the first pulled, then it is no answer. This theory suggests instructions are lost on how to decide whether to go with yes or no or the full alphabet setup. I love these cryptic theories episodes. Thank you. And a mixed system like this, you know, where you have yes, no, blank, and alphabet letters, that's possible. Um, I can't say whether it's the case. Another option in for what could indicate a, um, a non-answer wouldn't require a blank, but if you, if you pulled out alphabetic letters and they just didn't make any sense, you know, the priest looking at them can't form Hebrew words out of them, that also could be interpreted as a non-answer. The next feedback comes from Seth Garys via email, who writes, Loved the recent episode over the Urim and Thummim. As you were describing the possible theory that the Urim and Thummim may respond, correspond to the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it sounded very familiar to how Jesus described himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Is there any literature or scholarship they are aware of that describes a typological connection between the Urim and Thummim and the person of Jesus Christ? Thanks. Not that I'm aware of, but since Urim and Thummim start with the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph and Tau, um, I can see the connection. Uh, Urim and Thummim also mean lights and perfections, and Jesus came to give us perfect light about God. So one might be able to build a typological interpretation from the spiritual sense of the text on this theory. John Davis writes via email, I liked your hypothesis that the Urim and Thummim could possibly represent letters in the Hebrew alphabet and found an interesting ancient piece of supporting evidence. The second century Roman faience polyhedron. Faience. Faience. Thank you. Polyhedron did exactly that. And on the, the YouTube, you can see the image of it now on the screen. Yeah, um, there are several known polyhedra with uh, Greek and Roman letters on them, and we'll have a link to an article so that listeners can see one if they're not watching the video. Um, it's it's possible that a an object like this or several objects like this could have been used. Excellent. It, it, for those who uh, aren't watching the video, it looks like one of those dice used in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's, it, 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 the one we showed is a 12-sided die. Yeah, right. with different Greek letters on the different side. Yes. Then uh, Samantha Bice on YouTube writes, I always wonder who thought of this stuff first, like creating dye from snail slime. My guess would it be that it was somebody who was cutting up a snail or otherwise wrestling with one and got the purple slime all over their hands and then they wiped their hands on something and found maybe their clothes, maybe a piece of wood, but they then found that the purple was hard to get off again. Mm, that's a good theory. Zekadan on YouTube writes, assuming that the Urim and Thummim did give more complex answers than yes or no, it seems to me that they might have been a kind of lithomancy. The priest would cast the stones and then interpret the message from God based on possibly several factors, such as position and location, if they're reflecting light, and where they landed. There could be a stone for every tribe, and it could also be that the number of stones used changed based on the kind of question asked. For example, if it was a yes or no question, maybe few stones were used, but more complex questions could have used more stones. As far as interpreting them, I'm sure there were some guidelines, but of course, it's mainly up to the priest to interpret the answer. Yeah, there were many similar methods of obtaining knowledge like this in the ancient world, and there continue to be in various tribes today. I took a uh, whole course from the Ryan Education Institute on paranthropology or paranormal anthropology, where we looked at such methods. Uh, anthropologically speaking, the Urim and Thummim would be classified as lithomancy if they were stones. Lithos is the Greek word for stone, and they may well have been stone. So this could have been a form of lithomancy. However, they also could have been something else like bones. 
because bones are sometimes used this way as well. And in that case, it wouldn't be lithomancy, but osteomancy. David Kelly wrote on our Discord, I think I imagined the Urim and Thummim to be something like dry, dreidels with a few sides. What I don't get is why they appeared to be used so infrequently. If you had a direct connection to infallible, infallible answers, wouldn't you use them all the time? Were there some regulations about who and in what circumstances you could use them? Did they think that God would get upset if they were used too much? You do see this pattern where they're using them early on, like in the United Monarchy under David and Solomon, and then it kind of falls off, and by the after the Babylonian exile, they don't seem to be using them anymore. Um, they were associated with the priesthood, and so it was likely that only the high priest could use them, and he kept them in a pouch on his priestly garments. Um, but in those later centuries after the United Monarchy, but before the Babylonian exile, the high priesthood uh, became corrupt for significant periods and started worshiping other gods as well as Yahweh. So that may have contributed to the decline of the method's use, since they were now worshiping additional gods and not consulting Yahweh as much during part of their history before the Babylonian exile. And then during the Babylonian exile, you didn't have a functioning high priesthood, and by that point, the information of how to use them might have been lost. Now we have feedback coming from episode 216 on Robert Riggi. Rob writes on Facebook, I wonder if there's a name for a phenomena in which people believe they are friends with someone because they feel like they get to know them very well. I've had this feeling, listen to Jimmy Akin so much, and then realizing he doesn't know who I am. Maybe Riggi listened to Father Michael so much he thought the same. But I do know who you are, Rob. <laughs> Among other things, you're our mysterious feedback coordinator. And thank you very much for all the work you do for the show. Um, in terms of the question you ask, feeling like you know someone and having friendly feelings toward them, um, you know, if they're a public figure, that's actually pretty normal. Um, because you do get to know them by watching the media they produce. Uh, they also can be frank about personal matters. Um, so you do get to know them, you know, personal things about them. And you do feel friendly to them if they seem to be a nice person. So all that's perfectly normal. And these are what are known as, there is a term for this, it, these are what are known as parasocial interactions because they occur at a greater distance than normal social interaction. So it is a form, they're like other interactions, but instead of normal social ones where you interact directly, they're called parasocial. In some cases though, uh, they can become a bit problematic, in which case they're known as having, uh, someone in that situation is known as having a parasocial relationship uh, when the person who is the listener or viewer um, begins to literally believe that they're in more of a relationship than they actually are. In extreme cases, it can even turn into a delusional disorder, uh, which fortunately has never happened to me. Uh, perhaps in part because I'm all about teaching critical thinking skills, and so I attract listeners who use critical thinking skills and keep things in perspective. And it's perfectly natural for regular listeners to feel like they know me because I try to be open and honest and so I am letting people get to know me, and hopefully they'll feel friendly towards me as well, just like I feel friendly towards listeners. So that's all perfectly normal. Robert Niederman wrote on Facebook, this is basically an interview episode, but it's way easier to listen to than previous interview episodes. I chalk it up to a narrower topic, better editing, and less rambly guest. It's another example of the show improving more and more over time. Great work. Also, I tried to keep an open mind like Jimmy here, but right from the start, the alarm bells were going off. I expected to learn that his name wasn't even Robert Riggi. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's something, and there are lots of alarm bells. And so, yeah, for me too. Crystal OO on YouTube writes, Honest question, why? Why bother slandering someone like this? It doesn't take a genius to know he's a fraud, and those that believe in his nonsense will continue to believe until they wake up. It seems like a silly thing to waste a few hours on. Okay, so first, it wouldn't be slander. Slander involves saying false things about another person. Um, it could be detraction. Detraction is um, disclosing negative information about someone without a good reason. 
But I think there's a good reason here. You know, like I say, I never expect folks to agree with me. Um, so you're welcome to disagree, Crystal. But in this case, I think there was a worthwhile reason to do the show. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have done it. The reason I did the show was uh, kind of twofold. First, to illustrate research techniques uh, by providing Robert Riggi as a case study, as an example of here's how you can use research techniques to investigate someone when they need investigating. The second function was alerting people to the research that had been done on Robert Riggi in particular, because that can have a helpful effect. The more people know about the problems with him, the less he'll be able to take other people in, including other podcast hosts. Uh, recently, I followed up, I contacted Kenny Biddle, and, who was my guest on the show, and he tells me that since the problems with Riggi have been publicized, you know, like through his article in the Skeptical Inquirer, through the Mysterious World episode we did, um, that the number of shows that Riggi has been appearing on have plummeted. Uh, Kenny did see that he was scheduled to be on one show, but then Kenny said in the com box that he would be watching live. And so, you know, we hypothetically might call in or something and challenge Riggy. And after Kenny said that, you know, he's going to be watching in the com box, Riggy was a no-show. He didn't appear on the program. And since then, Kenny hasn't found Riggy appearing anywhere. And he previously was doing a ton of shows. I mean, a huge number of them. So publicizing the problems with him has resulted in him fooling a lot less people. Felix Lopez writes on Facebook, I hope there's some kind of legal action being taken on this guy. He's probably breaking the law and claiming to be a licensed medical practitioner. Could at least the persons and entities he claims were associated with him do something for his false claims about them? Yeah, potentially they could. Uh, he also has potential legal exposure, uh, especially in the jurisdiction in which he lives. And the publicization of the problems with his claims may also lead the authorities to initiate some kind of action on his case. Sam Shackelford writes on Facebook, I was definitely put off by the length of this episode until I started listening. I did the whole podcast in one sitting. Nice job. Glad you in, in enjoyed it, uh, Sam. Yeah, there can be a kind of slow burn <laughs> effect um, at times. Often, often what I will do is try to begin an episode with a gripping, vivid story. Uh, and then we can back up and look at the background and, and so forth. But when you've got a twist coming, like this guy is a total liar, it can it's hard to start with the gripping part of the story because you're holding back the twist. <laughs> That's right. Joyce the Trucker wrote on YouTube, just the claims he makes sound like recycled fertilizer. Some of what he cites as credentials are blatantly New Age hooey, and a convert to Catholicism as a convert to Catholicism by way of Wicca and the New Age movement, red flags and alarms went off right away. Yeah, as I said, for me too, the, as soon as I started uh, reading about, uh, as soon as I started, not not reading, but um, watching Riggy, I, 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 after Kenny asked me to check him out and give him an opinion, it's like, wow, this guy is, there is so much wrong here. Here's some feedback on episode 217, which was a Weird Questions episode, also from Joyce the Trucker, who wrote, So if Jesus and Mary, and possibly one or two Old Testament saints, are bodily in heaven, then doesn't heaven have to have some physical aspect to it? How can heaven be a purely spiritual state of blissful unity with God, worshiping him, if there are at least a few physical people in heaven? I'm confused. Yeah, heaven must have an aspect to it that at least allows it to receive bodies. Um, that capacity may be space, as we understand it, since for us bodies exist in space, or it could be something else, but, um, you know, not space as we understand it. But it has to at least have the capacity to receive bodies. This next group of feedback comes from episodes 218 and 219 on Kabbalah. Michael McFall on Facebook wrote, great two-part episode. Anything that attracts Hollywood types comes under immediate suspicion with me. I appreciate how you reviewed its major teachings and tenets and explained how some conflict with Catholic teachings. Great learning experience for me. Glad you enjoyed it, Michael. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun for me, too, to speak with Dr. Justin Sledge. 
Fidei Hortos wrote on Facebook, I was really intrigued by the mention in the second part of the 10 Edomite kings that in Kabbalistic thought become, became demons and servants of evil and who were thought to drift between this world and the spiritual realm. Right away, I was struck by the resemblance between these and the nine ring wraiths of the Lord of the Rings, how they were also once human kings who became demonic servants of Sauron and lived a shadowy existence both in this world and the hidden world visible to one who wore the ring of power. I wonder if Tolkien had this in mind when he formed these characters. Well, not as far as I know. Um, I mean, he did draw on on mythological themes in writing The Lord of the Rings, but my impression is that he was drawing much more on Northern European mythological ideas like from Scandinavia and Iceland and places like that. But I'm not a Tolkien scholar, so I don't know for sure. Uh, Catherine wrote on Facebook, very good episode. Looking forward to part two next week. For those of us who aren't Jewish, it's interesting to learn more of their history as it pertains to their various denominations. Uh, so this Catherine happens to be my cousin. And so thanks. Uh, glad you liked it. And always great to hear from you, cousin Catherine. Uh, Joe M. writes via email, I enjoyed the Kabbalah episodes. I was left wondering what their view on the age of the world is. To me, they must have a young earth slash cosmos perspective, or still look at the universe through a 15th century lens. If creation was only around 6,000 years old, then our actions would not seem as disproportionate in repairing a fragmented godhead. However, if the universe is 13 billion years old, our actions and even lifespan seem so disproportionate to a godhead of such a large creation. Yeah, I understand the appeal of this line of thinking. Um, I'm afraid that I haven't studied Kabbalistic views on the age of the cosmos, but I'll let you know if I find out more. Father Anthony wrote on Discord, This sounds great. I always wonder what the heck was up with Kabbalah and its relationship with esotericism. I never found a way to research it well without falling into reading some kind of New Age tract. Glad that Jimmy wants to tackle the issue with a professor. Yeah, Dr. Sledge was a great guest, and he will be back in the future to talk about more esoteric topics involving Judaism and possibly Christianity as well. Uh, Paulina Margasinska writes via email, I've listened to the Kabbalah episodes. I don't know if this would be interesting for you, but the word Kabbalah came into common use in the Polish language as Kabawa. Uh, which is looks like as an L in it, but it's pronounced Kabawa. Of course, it must have come to common use because of the history of my country and the many Jewish communities living here. In addition to the standard meaning of what Kabbalah is, in common use, it also means a complicated problem or situation with many intertwined facts and hard to solve. So you can use this word, for example, as an exclamation when you find yourself in or hear of this kind of situation. Polish dictionaries also list this word to mean a kind of divination using cards, but I've never heard it used that way. Thank you for these episodes. Now I know where this word came from. Well, thank you very much, Paulina. Um, it's great to learn about other languages and great to hear from a listener to uh, from a listener from Poland. Um, also, now I know that if I find myself uh, confronting a perplexing, <laughs> complex situation, I can just use an interjection and say "kabawa." <laughs> Eric Dilly writes on YouTube, Kabbalah technically isn't Jewish. The word Kabbalah is Jewish, but that doesn't mean it belongs to any race or country. That's like saying quantum physics is English because the word is English. Kabbalah is a form of metaphysical science. It's an adaptation of Hermeticism. Jewish mystics took the philosophy of Hermeticism, mixed in their myths and traditions, and called it Kabbalah. Yeah, so people of any belief system can adopt elements from other belief systems, and in religion, this is known as syncretism. Um, in describing Kabbalah as a form of Jewish mysticism, uh, Dr. Sledge and I were speaking of its historical origin and where it's most commonly practiced. But we also did notice and discuss uh, non-Jewish forms of Kabbalah, including Christian Kabbalah in schools of Christian esotericism going back a few centuries, and also modern pop Kabbalah. Cameron Byers writes on YouTube, Dr. Sledge mentioned burying sacred texts in a graveyard. I've never heard of this practice. Will you please explain a, a, explain a bit more in depth? Yeah, so the reason for burying sacred texts in Judaism is because they contain the divine name, you know, written. 
and it's considered disrespectful to simply throw these texts away. Uh, this is similar to the common Christian custom of burning or burying objects that have been blessed. Jewish synagogues and cemeteries uh, frequently have rooms known as genizas, uh, which are used to temporarily, or sometimes not so temporarily, store sacred texts until they're buried. Like I said, sometimes the storage isn't so temporary, and we've discovered important manuscripts and lost texts in Genizas that got stored there and then were never buried. Uh, this is particularly the case with the famous Cairo Geniza in Cairo, Egypt. It had 400,000 manuscript fragments, almost half a million manuscript fragments, and it included fragments from the original Hebrew version of the Book of Sirach, which, you know, is in the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, and we previously only had Greek versions of that, but then in the Cairo Geniza, we found, hey, here's some of the Hebrew. Um, it also had uh, fragments from the Damascus document and other fragments that were later found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in Israel. So uh, the practice of bearing books with the sacred name in Judaism is one that, and the associated custom of storing them in Genizas is one that has enriched scholarly knowledge of ancient literature. Uh, Budner writes on YouTube, I was originally quite bored with this. I enjoy specific ghost stories and the examination of them. However, at some point, I could not stop listening and even listened a second time. Thank you, SQPN, for another fascinating show. Thank you, uh, Butner. That's something that a lot of listeners have commented on, that sometimes they something they may think, oh, this isn't, isn't going to be to my taste, or I've never heard of this. I'd, why would this be interesting? And then they find that they really get interested as we go along. And that's the way it is for me. Um, I wouldn't do an episode if I didn't find it fascinating. So hopefully that enthusiasm and experience will transfer to the audience as well. Uh, Irony Matt on YouTube writes, fascinating episode. I very much appreciate the forthright nature of your guests. And also, I'd be remiss to mention a straightforward rendering of what the Talmud is. This is the first I've seen it clearly described as commentary on the Mishnah on top of the Mishnah being clearly described as oral teachings written later. Maybe I was just looking in all the wrong places, but there sure seems to be a lot of confusion floating around about those terms. Yes, they are unfamiliar terms to many people, and I've encountered, you know, problematic descriptions of what they are as well. But uh, Dr. Sledge is a careful and knowledgeable scholar, and I myself also always try to explain the Mishnah and the Talmud in an accurate way. Deb Scalisi on YouTube writes, great, great show. Dr. Sledge is a great guest, and the repartee between Jimmy and this guest was fantastic. Thank you both for such a great conversation. I would love to hear him again as a guest. Uh, he'll definitely be invited back. Among other things, I'm thinking about inviting him back for shows about uh, Shabbatai Tzevi, who was a false messiah, the most famous, um, and also an episode about Dibbuks, which are human spirits that come back and possess people, so ghosts that possess people. Hmm. So our next feedback comes from episode 220 on Eucharistic Miracles, and it is audio feedback, which I will play now. This is Daniel. I was very, well, not, well, yeah, I got somewhat disappointed in your uh, recent Eucharistic Miracles. Maybe very disappointed because it seems all you did was read a book or two uh, and assume that it was 100% true and never deal with the objection that the author may be lying to you or exaggerating or gullible and presenting as true claims that he did not verify, etc. You sort of just assumed that everything in the book was true and went from there. And so the entire episode was is not useful for any skeptic and is only useful for someone who's wanting to believe that it's true or not even that, but like oh, gullible is a word that comes to mind for someone who just assumes that, you know, if it's in a book, it must be true. Right. I mean, so I was a bit surprised by that since otherwise you are generally good with things in terms of, um, you know, rational inquiry. So it seems like a blind spot of sorts to just say, this guy's an Italian physician. He must, 
we, we don't even know if he's a physician, but, uh, you know, just, I mean, unless you know the guy, I mean, like, he's been to Italy, et cetera, you know where his office is. I mean, it's just, I don't know. There, there, you, should, you should have spent more time on that, at least. How do we know we can even trust this guy that anything he says is true, right? And similarly, you just declare, well, religious people wouldn't lie. Um, you know, we, we, you'd have to have grounds to believe that they would, that, that, you know, to impugn the, the, um, the ex, you know, the religious people. But, um, you know, it's easy to say that they want money and for their, for whatever reason, right? I mean, like, just wanted to share that. Um, thanks, Pike. Okay, well, thank you very much for your feedback, Daniel. Um, I'm sorry you were disappointed, but I hope I can explain the approach that I take. Um, it is not possible for anyone, including me, to personally verify every single claim they encounter. Uh, at some point, we have to give at least provisional credence to what we're being told. That's foundational to human communication. We all have at least provisional trust in what is communicated to us unless we have reason to doubt it, such as knowing that we're dealing with an unreliable source. I therefore will not be able to do detailed cross-examination of every single claim of every source that we use on the show. Uh, that would cause everything to grind to a halt, and uh, shows would never come to an end, and I'd never be able to finish a script if I had to prove every single claim from the ground up. It would be like Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, where they literally took 379 pages to prove that one plus one equals two. Um, you know, I'd never get scripts done at that rate. However, that doesn't mean that I'm uncritical about sources. I do not assume that something is true just because it's in a book. In fact, I, in the history of the show, we've looked at a number of books where I've analyzed it and said, don't trust anything this book says. This is a hoax. Um, so I'm actually quite careful about sources, and that includes on this subject. Uh, there are lots of books about Eucharistic miracles that are out there, many of which are popular devotional books, uh, but I don't have confidence that the authors of those books are careful scholars, and I suspect them of making unreliable, exaggerated claims. So I waited to do this episode until I had a book from a medical professional who was citing scientific studies. Uh, have I gone to Italy and, you know, personally uh, insisted on seeing his medical diploma? Well, no, I haven't. But as before, nobody can check out all the claims of everybody. And Dr. Serafini and his medical credentials are known to both his Italian publisher and his English language publisher. And he is also listed as a physician on websites that I have checked. Um, I have no reason to think that he's committing the crime of impersonating a doctor. Uh, further, uh, I did not say that religious people don't lie. They do. Um, however, I can't just assume that someone is lying. I need evidence to accuse them of lying. And that's a principle I apply to everybody, uh, whether they're religious or not. I will not accuse a non-religious person of lying either, unless I have evidence that they are. Uh, finally, you mention money, and money can't be a motive for people to lie, whether they're religious or non-religious. But I won't accuse people of lying for money unless I have evidence, and I don't have evidence of lying in this case. And Dr. Serafini um, cited studies, you know, scientific studies that are referenced in the footnotes of his book. So I hope that helps explain my approach. Rob Leonardi writes on Facebook, I would have appreciated if you could have distinguished between the belief in the real presence via the actual real presence and how the authority of holy orders makes it possible, especially to explain the Orthodox and Catholic valid sacraments versus the others that are not valid, specifically getting to the heart of the matter with talking about transubstantiation versus consubstantiation. Finally, I think there needs to be a distinction between a time warp and the fact that the Mass represents the sacrifice on Calvary as it is the one and same sacrifice. If this is not considered a time warp, would there not have been a time warp associated with the Eucharist at the Last Supper? 
considering they were partaking of the banquet feast in heaven with Jesus still physically with them, would this not also be the case for all of the time when they celebrated the Eucharist until the Ascension? So I could have gone into the fact that valid holy, holy, valid holy orders are needed in order to validly confect the Eucharist. Um, however, I have to make choices in what to include. And this episode was on Eucharistic miracles, you know, the miracles specifically, rather than on sacramental theology. Also, all of the Eucharistic miracles that we covered occurred in a Catholic context, except for the one Anglican one that I concluded was an optical illusion. Um, so, you know, I could have gone into more detail, but, you know, I'm most of the audience is Catholic and, and, or, or Orthodox and knows their sacramental theology pretty well. And this was just a detail that I didn't happen to include um, because it wasn't, the show wasn't on that detail. Uh, when it comes to the time warp theory, I don't see why one would be present at the Last Supper or during the period between the resurrection and the ascension. The, I mean, the, the argument uh, you mentioned um, turns on the premise of we are participating in the heavenly banquet feast, and Jesus wasn't yet in heaven at that point. But um, it's true today that we're participating in the heavenly banquet feast with Jesus in heaven, but I don't see why the disciples couldn't at the Last Supper uh, have simply been receiving the flesh of Christ who was standing right there in front of them on earth with no time warp involved. And the same would be true of the period between the, um, between the resurrection and the ascension. Uh, it may be true now, and to what extent one even says we're um, participating in the heavenly banquet, that's sort of a matter of theological opinion. It can be taken different ways. And it may be true now um, that that's happening in a robust sense, but that doesn't mean it was true at the Last Supper or during the early transitional period before Jesus returned to heaven, because different circumstances applied then. It was the first Mass, and then it was this transitional period where he wasn't in heaven yet. Um, though even in those cases, you could say that they were anticipating the heavenly banquet, but in a non-timey-wimey way of foreshadowing. Rick Mansfield, a patron, writes on Patreon, In your recent episode on Eucharistic miracles, Jimmy gave statistics indicating well over 50% of the population believe in the real presence. I believe that to be misleading, as approximately 70% of Catholics do not believe. Okay, so there's two things to say here. Um, the first one is that there are problems with the claims you often hear in the press uh, in reports about how many people don't believe in the real presence. Uh, the surveys that, that drive those stories have flawed questions. They don't clearly present the Church's teaching as one of the options, and so people get confused about which of these options that sound kind of the same am I supposed to pick. And then because of that confusion, you have uh, you have sort of the vote being split among these different options, and that makes it possible for to craft a narrative where you say, oh, look at these, all these people don't say exactly what they ought because the questions were misphrased. And that creates an exaggerated idea of how much, uh, how many people don't believe in transubstantiation. And then when these get reported in the press, they get sensationalized, and then that gets people up in arms, and then the people, a lot of people who read them, want a, na a narrative where, oh, everything is as bad as possible in the church, and they'll exaggerate it even further. So the statistics in this area are not good and are exaggerated. However, second thing to say, I was careful not to say that 50% of Christians believe in the real presence, because I don't have evidence of that. Instead, what I said was that, quote, something like 85% of world Christians today belong to churches that teach the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, close quote. That's a direct quote from the script. So I talked about how many people are affiliated 
with churches that teach the real presence, not necessarily transubstantiation, but some form of the real presence to their people. Uh, I carefully avoided making any claim about the percentage of individual Christians who personally believe it, because I don't have good worldwide statistics on that. Jake Justin writes on Twitter, Blessed Carlo Acutis had a website cataloging Eucharistic miracles. My son, age 11, is very interested in Carlo's life and canonization. I haven't heard anything new in a couple of years. Are there any updates on his canonization? So he's already a blessed, and the next step to sainthood is canonization itself. Uh, since Carlo Acutis was, canonized, was uh, beatified in 2020, he has not been canonized, but his cause is still underway in Rome. And at some point, they may announce a second miracle performed through his intercession, which would then open the way for full canonization. Uncultured, uncultured Paleset on Discord writes, Good episode. I agree we should take this stuff seriously. The only reason I don't think we can jump to God from this is because credible miracle reports happen in other religions, too, like with rainbow bodies in Tibetan Buddhism. I'd love to see Jimmy do an episode on ra rainbow bodies or on miracles in other religions and how to approach them in general. So I don't have a good source of information about rainbow bodies. I mean, I've, 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 I've got a little, but not enough to build a whole episode around. But feel free to recommend uh, resources. In fact, that's a general thing. Anytime people recommend a topic for a future episode, it helps me out and helps make the episode happen faster if you can recommend good resources that I can look at and, and possibly uh, employ in researching the episode. Um, the topic of miracles in other religions is one I definitely have thoughts on, and I don't dismiss them outright. Neither did the authors of the Bible. Um, how to regard them is, in general, it's more of an apologetic topic than a mysterious one. So I don't know that I'd do an episode of Mysterious World just on that topic, but I'm sure it will come up in the future, um, such as in episodes that happen to mention a particular non-Christian um, that's associated with the miraculous. For example, um, if I ever do an episode on the Jewish figure known as the Baal Shem Tov, um, he was reported to perform miracles, and so we would talk about it in that context. Mama Jean writes on Discord, I was surprised to hear Jimmy said that Methodists believed in the true presence in the Eucharist. I was raised in the United Methodist Church and was taught that they viewed communion as a symbolic exercise, not the true presence. Maybe I misunderstood what Jimmy had said? Well, uh, no, you didn't. Um, opinions may vary among Methodist churches, and it's possible that you may have been raised in one that held to a symbolic presence view. But belief in real presence, in the real presence, is common in Methodist circles. Uh, we'll have a link to a page at the United Methodist Church's website, their main denominational page, um, that contains the following question and answer. The question is, do United Methodists believe the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ? And the answer is, in the great thanksgiving, we ask the Holy Spirit to be poured on us and on the gifts of bread and wine we offer. We ask for the Spirit's outpouring to make the bread and wine be for us the body and blood of Christ, so we, who receive them, may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. We believe God answers this prayer, yes, and the Spirit does all these things. Christ is really present here, and Christ's presence really changes us. Close quote. So, and this is not just something I learned from their website. I, I looked up their website after your question, but from theological reading going back years in books, I've been aware that, yes, Methodists, being an offshoot of the Anglican Church, um, do tend to honor the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, at least broadly, though I can't speak for all Methodists. Michael Thomas writes on YouTube, what about the heart beating inside the host? Did you not take this year's miracle in Mexico into account? The phenomenon was caught clearly on camera on July 24th during adoration. Yeah, so uh, this event uh, happened after we recorded the episode. Uh, otherwise, I would have included it. Um, I have seen video of it, and yeah, it does look like a, a, a host in a 
in a monstrance is throbbing. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the evidence I need at present to come to a conclusion about this. Um, in particular, I don't presently have evidence that I would need to eliminate the possibility that the apparent beating or pulsation is an optical illusion, such as caused by maybe a ceiling fan that is blocking or reflecting light off the monstrance. Um, I don't reject the idea that there was a miracle here, but I don't have the evidence I need to decide one way or the other, um, and I wasn't there to examine the site. So for the moment, I don't have I don't have a way of deciding between those options, but I would have covered it if it had happened before we uh, did the sh before we recorded the show. Michael McFall wrote on Facebook, I was so looking forward to this episode about Eucharistic miracles. It's a subject I've been fascinated about for years. When you pointed out at the start of the show that every consecrated consecrated host at every mass is a Eucharistic miracle, that realization blew me away. Thanks for a great episode, Jimmy. Thank you, and glad you found the insight helpful. It also was, to me, when I was writing the script, it's like, well, you know, this happens at every Mass. We're just not talking about that type of miracle. Right, right. Every Mass is a wonderful miracle. And Jesus is present, even if we can't see it in the same way. And yeah. that's that's what I love to, I, that's what I teach my own kids about, is that's why we pay attention to Mass. <laughs> All right. So that's it for feedback this time. We had a lot of great feedback and we love to get your feedback. You too can send in your mysterious feedback on any of the topics we cover. And you can do that by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mis underscore world. You can send uh, in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or by calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515 that's 619-738-4515 and be sure if you're not uh if you haven't checked out the video version of jimmy aiken's mysterious world go to my youtube channel youtube.com slash jimmy aiken and while you're there I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get a notification whenever I produce a new video, whether it's for Mysterious World or whether it's something else. You'll find links to our notes on today's show at mysterious.fm slash 234A. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Don. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.